when you have that small number of people controlling this big a portion of the economy, there's always a risk that they will do things that are uh, in their own interest or at a minimum, just not in the interest of the public at large. That is a real democratic deficit for capitalism. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. I wonder if listeners could guess the one topic where Bethan and I disagree the most. Okay, that's pretty obvious. It's private equity. This might be an overstatement, but Bethany thinks that private equity is evil and is representing everything that is bad in the world. And um, I have more mixed views. I think that there is some that is evil, some that might actually be good. (laughs) Well, it might be an overstatement to say that I think private equity is evil, but modern big private equity, maybe so. When Joe and I reported our book, The Big Fail, I was really struck by a study showing basically that private companies bought by private equity firms are 10 times more likely to go bankrupt as as those that aren't. As I think our listeners know, I'm a believer in capitalism, but I'm a believer in an old school kind of capitalism where people make money, even fortunes, yes, because they build a business that provides jobs for other people and services and goods that the world needs, not because they destroy the business and the jobs. But Bethany, you know that most people die in bed doesn't mean that sleeping is a dangerous thing to do or laying down in bed is dangerous, is that you're more likely to lay down when you're about to die. So private equity, most of the time, intervenes when things are really bad. And so I think that the fact that it's associated with a lot of bankruptcy is not that surprising. Now, this is not saying that there not be some uh, evilness in private equity. I don't want to defend the entire category. But just saying that they are 10 times as likely to go bankrupt is kind of the nature of the beast. I don't think it's a proof of their evilness. Yeah, that's that's an interesting argument, and I think you would have to go through almost on a case-by-case basis. But I have been really troubled over the past 20 or so years by the rise of something known as a dividend recapitalization, in which a private equity firm, which is already the very definition of private equity, is that it takes a company private using a great deal of debt, adds more debt after the original deal in order to get cash. And they add this debt to the business, not to reinvest in the business, but to pay themselves a dividend. But, But here's the thing for our listeners. When Luigi and I were mulling around episode ideas, we actually found something about private equity on which we agree, that private is a misnomer. In my view, it's a misnomer because private equity firms not only control so much of the the market today, but because their investors are often, their underlying investors are often teachers, firefighters, in other words, ordinary Americans who are invested in private equity through through their pension funds. And so if the underlying investors are the same as the investors in your publicly traded company, why does private equity get to be private? And Luigi, I'm not sure that would be your argument for why private is a misnomer, but I think you you agree with that issue too. Yeah, I agree very much that society is not well served by the secrecy of private equity. We honestly don't know what is the real return of this investment or the risk adjustment return of this investment. As, as a result, the entire allocation of capital in the economies is hampered by this uh, lack of knowledge. And the weaker institution in this game are losing out. So I'm not worried about Yale and Harvard Endowment because they're doing very well in private equity. I am worried. Actually, my uh, favorite example when I, I teach this stuff is the Wisconsin Fireman Retirement Fund. I don't know whether it exists or not, but it's like an hypothetical one that is lure into private equity, but they are not particularly good at benchmarking and they might put their money in the wrong place. And I think that that's a cost uh, for them, but also it's a cost for society at large because money is not well utilized. 
I'd previously reviewed Harvard Law professor John Coates's book, The Problem of Twelve, and we'll get back to the title and what it means for the Washington Monthly, and I was struck by his observations on this topic. Coates wrote, the capital put at risk by private equity firm owners is just as much other people's money as it is when invested in public companies. The way private equity is private is that it is clothed in secrecy. And so here we are today, and private equity is expanding into something called private credit, which is basically the business of providing financing to companies using funds raised from investors, not in the public debt markets. Um, firms, big private equity firms like Blackstone and KKR are rolling out products that are marketed to well-off investors. And these firms are going public themselves. It seems more and more absurd that they, they get to be private. And I also start to worry that when you see these things, it means, it means the party is about to end. And guess who's going to be left holding the bag? Okay, but Luigi, I know what you're going to say to me, which is that the private equity is not all that Coates' book is about, and that it actually might be about something entirely different than really than private equity. Yeah, I read this book as being about concentration in financial markets, not just about private equity, because it discusses also index funds that are simply funds that are not active, so they're not picking stocks, but they are replicating a index like a Standard & Poor 500 index. They're very cheap, but uh, they're so cheap that they are becoming the primary form of investing for a lot of people. And so they have a disproportionate amount of money and voting rights under control. So I, I regard the major theme of this book as concentration everywhere. So Coates' argument is not just that private equity poses a problem or that index funds pose a problem. It's that they have become so concentrated. He argues that index funds now control somewhere between 20 and maybe even over 30 percent of the votes of American corporations, and that over the last 20 years, private equity funds have grown from around $770 billion of global assets under management to $12.1 trillion, which means their growth was four to five times faster than the growth of the the U.S. economy as, as a whole. And so his argument isn't just that private equity is bad or index funds are bad. In fact, he actually doesn't argue that at all. His argument is that the size of the two of them is what's problematic. And when it comes to private equity, one of the points that Coates make, makes, which is uh, very important, is that they might actually be so large that they might gain market power. Recently, the Federal Trade Commission brought a suit against uh, Walsh, Carson, and Anderson, who did uh, what is in jurga called a roll-up of anesthesia partners in Texas. A roll-up is you buy a lot of little practices and you put them all together. And because they're small, there's no antitrust review. And then by the time you buy, bought them all, you get a huge market power. And, you know, when you go to surgery, you don't pick your anesthesiologist. is just assigned to you. And so they set the prices, and the prices are incredibly high. So next time, hopefully you don't go to surgery, but next time you go to the hospital and you see like a surprise billing, uh, part of that surprise billing might be due to the market power of private equity firms. So who better to discuss why private equity funds get to be private and why your banal index fund actually poses a threat to democracy than Coates himself? So I thought we'd start with a pretty basic question. What is the problem of 12? And what made you start working on this book? A few years ago, I was teaching at Harvard Business School, and they asked me to do a little primer for their MBAs on what are the big things that are ongoing changes to U.S. public company corporate governance. And the three big things that have changed the most, the rise of index funds and the rise of private equity funds. Both types of asset management companies uh, enjoy pretty powerful economies of scale. So as they get bigger, they get better. And as they get better, they get bigger. And the result of concentration in financial markets, you know, like might raise a traditional antitrust concern, but that's not really what I mean by the problem of 12. What I mean by it is power over the economy. It's not intentional. I don't think anybody in either industry ever set out to get that much concentrated power, but it is true now that less than a dozen people across those two industries, on the one hand, control in excess of 25 to 30% of all the equity of every US listed company, that's index funds, and 25% roughly of non 
public equity is controlled by the private equity industry uh, and a small number of players in that industry as well. And that means when things don't go well in the economy broadly, there is a perceived gap between the accountability and the legitimacy of how that economy is being run. It's a sort of a double problem, at least for index funds. Uh, I like index funds, to be clear, as a financial product. I use them. I think they're wonderful. I think they drive down fees. I think they do all kinds of great financial things. But they're so good at it, they're producing real political risk for themselves. The other side of the problem is when you have that small number of people controlling this big a portion of the economy, there's always a risk that they will do things that are uh, in their own interest or at a minimum, just not in the interest of the public at large. That is a real democratic deficit for capitalism to be perceived as being oligarchic in that way. I'm 100% with you about the political cost, but very often people push back. And while everybody understands market power very clearly, can you give us a example, a couple of examples of really political power that is different than market power and something that uh, you are personally concerned about? You know, the classic war story for index funds now is the Exxon proxy fight from a couple of years ago, where for the first time in the history of the world's largest oil company, the current board didn't get to pick the current board. A tiny little hedge fund that nobody had ever heard of before ran a slate that 15 years ago wouldn't have had a chance in hell at getting elected. How did it win? With 0.01% of the stock of Exxon, it won by convincing the major index funds to support uh, three of the four candidates who, who then got elected. They're not the only ones who voted in favor, but they were outcome determinative. The key point is without the index fund concentration, that hedge fund would have had to make its pitch to hundreds of dispersed asset managers and thousands and millions of dispersed individuals and almost certainly would have lost but for the concentrated ownership of the index funds. So that's on the index fund side as an example. A more recent one, a pending one right now, there's a proxy fight going on at Starbucks run by labor. It probably won't work is my bet, but it has a chance and it has a chance in part because they convinced uh, State Street to support one of the initiatives last year, a year ago, on disclosure related to, to labor treatment. That's interesting, right? That's a different kind of way in which labor is using different tools to, to pursue its ends. Certain folks who don't like labor power will view that with great horror, and those who love labor will think that's great. But either way, it's power. It's a type of power channel through the index funds that, that was not there previously. Private equity, you know. Can, can we stop there for a second uh, before you go into private equity? Sorry, Bethany, if I want to interrupt, because I think that the two are a little bit different, so I think it would be useful to separate them. And in that particular example, I'm not so sure that I see as, as, a, as a negative. In a sense, if you give, in the history, the uh, board was self-perpetuating with no input from the shareholders, the fact that all of a sudden the there is a more concentration that pay more attention and gives more feedback. I see it overall as a positive, not as a negative. I, I, I'm fairly careful in the book to not necessarily describe any particular outcome as good or bad. I happen to think climate change is caused by humans and we should be doing something about it. So all in all, I kind of like the fact that the Exxon board now has on it somebody who knows more about sustainability than they used to have. I could go through a list of other outcomes that I'm happy with uh, where the index fund power has been brought to bear. On the other hand, I can give you examples where I don't agree with it. So they've all largely failed to back, and here's something I think you care about, Luigi, the disclosure of corporate little, level political activity been resolutions brought to get companies to be more open about how the corporations like Exxon are using their power in the political system. The index funds have not supported those proposals. That's the reason they've not passed. And the key point then is not so much good or bad on any particular outcome, but they're the players. It's a dozen people or less at these index funds who are deciding one way or the other whether Exxon's going to go greener or not, whether Exxon's going to disclose how much money it gives to uh, the, uh, the state level AG organizations. Uh, whether uh, Starbucks is going to be nice to its labor uh, unions, uh, go down the list. So it's just, it's it's neither necessarily good or bad. Do we like a world better where Exxon's board is immune from shareholder pressure or a world where 
a few people at Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street can force them to change. I, neither of those is clearly better or worse to me from like an overall welfare perspective, but they're very different worlds from a power perspective. One other way to think about this one is since the 40s, we forced regulatory agencies to be somewhat open and engage with the public in the US before they pass rules. These index funds are functioning a lot like governmental agencies, but they have no public overlay of required engagement with their very dispersed owners, on who, but whose money, by the way, they're, they're managing, right? That's where the power comes from. It's not, if this were, you know, their own individual money, we'd have a different conversation, but this is power derived and it's very much accidental. None of us give our money to Vanguard thinking, oh, they'll be my political representative. It's just a sort of side effect of their uh, uh, incredible efficiency. It seems to me there is a very simple solution to the problem you're describing, which is, and some of the already implementing, which is the pass-through voting, is the fact that you give the ultimate power to vote to who, people who own the stuff. And uh, to simplify this, either you have some guidelines or organize some uh, representative assembly. In a, we had in our podcast, uh, Ellen Landemore, who is a big supporter of these uh, citizen assemblies. And so if you want to get the opinion of people without costing a lot to everybody, what you can have is simply a random uh, representative of your investors in the index funds that decide what to vote on political disclosure, what to vote on the environment, and what to vote on uh, animal welfare. And I see this as an enormous uh, improvement to our more democracy rather than less. I'm generally in agreement with that direction. But here's where the country lawyer is going to say to the financial economist, uh, yeah, that's not so simple. I think it's a 10 to 20 year pretty heroic effort to get close to the vision that you just painted. Partly, let's be clear, pass through voting as currently being rolled out by the big guys um, is not that. They're not passing the votes through, except to institutions. BlackRock can do that because most of it, not you know, a big chunk of its money is to big institutions. So that's easy to work out. The bigger problem is is to retail, which is still a lot of the money, most of the money for Vanguard. Here's the challenge: four thousand companies, you know, a couple shareholder resolutions, and and you know, a hundred uh, contested elections and other issues per year, millions of investors with similar but not exactly the same portfolios. How do you take all the information relevant to that and reduce it down to a simple enough form that your typical retail will be willing to engage, you know, other than on the margin? Now, even some engagement is a political gain. It, it helps diffuse the sense that there's just 12 guys in a room deciding everything. But to really create that modern, like, electronic democracy idea, there's got to be things a little bit like political platforms and parties and reduction of that complexity. I think it's going to be a long, complicated push-pull. They're going to want to say they outsource all the, the true power to their end clients, but they're not really going to want to do that. When it comes to a merger vote where a lot might turn, then they're going to face pretty strong fiduciary uh, duty pressures of their own to hold on to that power and not just throw it open to whomever happens to show up to vote. There's also going to be a risk that the craziest people from the end of either of the political spectrum, either end of the political spectrum, will be the only ones to show up. And so if you build a system that lets them have outsized influence, that's probably worse than the status quo. And then finally, the biggest challenge, frankly, is technological. So like, here's a, like, a fact that very few people appreciate. Um, until this year, this past calendar year, even through a normal broker channel, you could not get a confirmation back that your direction down through the broker, down through the client, down through the bank, or the, to, to DTC and into the voting system was voted the way you wanted. First time in U.S. history, they finally got a system to allow through brokers. Now, transpose that to a fund, and the fund owns stock in Exxon. The fund raises money from a 401k, which in turn is sponsored by a dentist office, which in turn has 12 employees. And you've got layers and layers to push up and down these instructions through. They do not have the technological capability to do that today. And it will be very expensive for them to build this. And there's a, finally then a real trade-off here between the more elaborate the governance system you build, 
the greater pressure you put on the whole index fund model, which is to keep costs as low as possible. So there's going to be a really tough trade-off at the end of the day between how much true pass-through do we want versus uh, how much money we're willing to spend with the technology. So I, I do think we'll get there, but I think it's going to be, as I say, 10 or 20 years before uh, anybody really puts all that together well. Index funds seem like power that could be exercised, and maybe there are some examples of it being exercised, but it, it doesn't seem quite as possibly malevolent as private equity in terms of the, the damage to our system. At least index funds have been good for investors. They've been the right call for investors over the years. They've been a great innovation. It's unclear that private equity has been that. They've done damage to swaths of the economy, and there is there are these I'd almost break it into two parts and tell me if you agree with this about the, the, the lack of legitimacy. One is that it's it's not private anymore, a point you make very eloquently. There's there's no way in which this should be considered private. But also just watching so many people or this handful of people make so much money from deals that 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 leave swaths of the economy in trouble is also a, another form of delegitimizing capitalism. Um, so I, I, I almost see them as I, I, I see the, I, I see the commonality, but the, but the differences seem so big to me. I, it, it's fair. They present similar problems. When you pivot to solutions and threat to the, you know, like specific kinds of threats, they get very different. And just to be clear, index funds are already subject to significantly more regulation than private equity. By design, index funds disclose their votes, they disclose their holdings, they disclose their governance system, et cetera, et cetera. Private equity has done a very good job of convincing Congress to exempt them from disclosure regulation. So we really don't know how they function except uh, through enterprising journalists and the occasional whistleblower and, and occasional bankruptcy cases. The place where I depart a little bit from standard critiques of private equity is I think the industry is actually very different across different sectors and, and types of funds. And I, I personally think the biggest threats that private equity poses, although fair point, we don't really know because of lack of disclosure, um, is in sectors where uh, law is not that great, uh, medical services. We rely on professionals and their own uh, socialization into a set of norms that that prevent them from sacrificing patient health for profit to limit the damage that certain healthcare setups can do. Now, it's not to say doctors are perfect. They're not. And there's ways in which certainly they're always tempted to also um, uh, engage in, in, in malpractice. But you add private equity to the mix and you change the nature of governance over those medical professionals. And that's where I think private equity's model, which is I think pretty good for uh, a widget manufacturer, you know, buying and selling and you want to get costs down and get efficient. They're like, I'm in favor of private equity. But when it comes to places where you can't regulate the behavior very well, I think private equity is a recipe for disaster. It just, it, it generates incentives to, to externalize harm as long and as, and as strongly as you can. But before we get to that, we need more information. And I actually think the sector, I think private equity itself, the leaders get this. Like if you interview the leaders of the top private equity complexes off record, they would grant they have a PR problem and they would be willing to embrace more disclosure to help deal with it. Now, that's a negotiation and I'm not predicting how that'll come out, but I do think even they see that long run, they're facing a collective action problem where some of their worst sector actors are going to end up generating bad political wins for all of them unless they do something to address it now. I hope you're right. That might be the most optimistic thing I've heard in a while. Anyway, <laughs> I try to be optimistic. You write really eloquently about the problems with private equity, about about the the fact that this the, the only thing that's private about this business is that it's very secretive because most of the investors now or a huge chunk of the investors are through pension funds and they're just the same people who are invested in the stock market. And now you have firms like KKR and Blackstone rolling out uh, products that are marketed specifically to well-off investors. So more and more, the idea of private as a distinction without a difference, even as the industry expands dramatically now into private credit and makes up more and more of a share of merger and acquisition volume each year. So why is it why isn't the solution just to get to get rid of the distinction and just say, okay, if your company is bought by a private equity firm, you still have to file with the SEC. And you private equity firm, whether you're public or not, you also have to file your investor letters with the SEC because there's nothing that's there's nothing that's private about this. So as a pure 
policy matter, I think you make a pretty good case, and I embrace it. Uh, as a political matter, the SEC passed what honestly are pretty light tweaks to the private fund industry regulation this past year over the vehement objection of the combination of hedge funds, private equity funds, venture capital funds, and their trade representatives. They've been sued in the SEC, that is, for that uh, rulemaking in the Fifth Circuit, which is partisan and highly likely to come out in favor of the trade group. The lead plaintiff is a uh, a new uh, trade group that was set up in Dallas, according to the Wall Street Journal, in order to bring this lawsuit, in order to get jurisdiction in the Fifth Circuit. They're very smart. They, they've they been playing this just this narrow little game on the SEC's rules from before it was even on the SEC agenda, and they were ready to go with the lawsuit the moment the rule got finalized. And they have a decent shot of winning in the lawsuit. And if they win, depending on how the court writes that decision, the SEC's current authority to do anything might very well be significantly curtailed, even from the plain text of the of the 34 Act, which which is the basis for the SEC's authority. So that's under current law with our current highly dysfunctional litigation system layered on top of it. To do what you want to do clearly would require an act of Congress to, to state why I think it's a good idea beyond the point you made. No other country does it the way we do. Every developed economy says above some scale we need disclosure. It doesn't really matter what the ownership structure is. It doesn't matter whether it's nominally one owner or 10 or a fund with 100 or a fund with 1,000 or a million stacked on top of each other. If it's above some size, if it's got a big enough role in the national economy, then there ought to be some basic disclosure about that portfolio company level operation. And then funds also are regulated and have disclosure obligations once they get above a certain level of size. I, I think that's like from a political economy, economy perspective, pretty commonsensical, but it will push against, you know, 120 years of U.S. legal tradition. And, uh, you know, the Republican Party would probably be united by fewer things. And frankly, the Democrats, too. I mean, you know, we, we, let's remember it was Schumer who helped keep carried interests from being taken away. So, you know, they, they're pretty good at the political game, too. So, like, I, I, in the short run given the difficulty of legislative change and given the difficulties the SEC has had already just doing modest changes, I think the more promising thing actually is to focus on the pension fund layer. Part of the problem is that the pension fund managers, frankly, are not up to the task of engaging with the private equity industry as investors. People think they are, but they're not, I don't think. And yeah, and there, there, there are more of them and they're in different states and they're regulated at that level. And so there's some greater openings there for, um, I think, change uh, that can be completely neutrally defended. We want to make sure that the taxpayers are not going to have to pick up the the deficit when the pension fund investments run short. And how are we going to know that? We need to understand what they're doing. We need to know more about what they're investing in. And that's private equity increasingly these days. So that's a avenue in. Of course, the private equity industry could eschew pension fund money and say, we don't want it anymore, but that would be, you know, that would be hard for them. So I think that's a probably politically viable path more so than getting Congress to do anything. Having said that, the one opportunity will be is if we have a significant recession coupled with a massive turndown, coupled with massive write-offs, because eventually private equity will have to realize gains and then or losses. And that would be another political moment where uh, potentially we could uh, have some sensible disclosure changes. Why don't I try a slightly different avenue? When you look at other countries, one of the considerations that people have is that in many of the mostly developing countries, you have these large conglomerates who have too much power. And even in the United States in the late 60s, there was a famous conglomerate merger wave. And at the time, a bunch of people started to raise issue that maybe those conglomerate mergers are a violation of antitrust. Since then, we have a development of a economic theory of multi-market contact that uh, the simpler way to say is much easier to sustain tacit collusion if we have contacts in multiple markets. And so if I control three large uh, firms in three different markets and you other private equity firms control three other firms in the, in the same three markets, uh, even without talking, we can agree on higher prices in a much more effective way. So why don't we start looking seriously about the market power that these large conglomerates, because this is what they are, right? The, the private equity firms are large conglomerates. 
with all the defects of the conglomerates. One is market power. The other is political power, because they make it much easier to administer reward and punishment to every politician and every regulator on the face of earth. Even the revolving doors don't work very well, because, uh, or limit to the revolving world, because you can hire people in a different industry. And so you don't see it, but I am able to reward people who go my way and punish people who don't comply. So I am in favor, too, of using a more flexible approach to antitrust to take on concentrated power. U.S. antitrust law used to have this character. You alluded to it in, in possible applications in, in the 60s. And even going back to the 50s, there were uses of antitrust in places that probably wouldn't happen today. Wait, wait, but the law has not changed. The law has not changed. It's only the lawyers who change. So we can change them back. Well, so, but the way they changed was the business community invested massively in funding very well-paid uh, uh, vacations in Florida for the federal judiciary, where they were lectured to by University of Chicago law professors about why antitrust was only good if it was only focused on consumer welfare, narrowly defined with a very particular approach to market definition. And that, unfortunately, has gotten baked into our case law. And one of the perverse things, I love the common law. I like the way it works. I think it's a it's a wonderful human invention, but it has a one flaw it has is it relies on precedent in a kind of stupid way. So if a judge decides in 1975 that he's been convinced by Henry Manny that the right way to think about antitrust is this way, and then he writes an opinion reflecting that view of economics, 10 years pass, the economists keep thinking and go, actually, you know what? That Manny view was just dumb. It, it actually, it, the model was silly. He, he had made some totally inoperative assumptions. Our models today are much closer to the kind, Luigi, that you're sketching as legitimate pictures of reality. But the law has now baked in that Henry Manny view from 1975. And so it does not update to keep up with the current thinking in economic schools. But I think you're too negative with the common law and too positive with the American democracy because uh, you can easily overturn precedents. In the sense, when it comes to abortion, it was overturned. So I don't think it's that difficult to overturn a precedent if there is a political will. And the problem is not that they can't. The problem is that the system has appointed to the Supreme Court a bunch of people who are completely convinced of the opposite. And this has been done as you point out, I think not enough in your book, because I think that most people are not that familiar with the power memorandum. I'm obsessed by it. By it. You mentioned it in passing, but I think it's a very important moment that uh, indicates how business really got together to change the Supreme Court in order to protect its interests. And every problem in American democracy starts there. I'm with you, but that, that's exactly why it's going to be hard to change. I mean, let me ask you this. If I could make George Soros write you a check for $100 million and you wanted to drop that into activism of some kind, one choice would be to say we're going to try to drop it into retraining federal judges. We're going to have our own boot camp and we're going to like bring them to a better place and teach them, you know, even warmer place and teach them uh, updated antitrust economics. And then they will then go back. We don't need to change the Supreme Court. We just need to change the minds of the federal judges who are at least open to a good trip and, and, and some uh, presentations. Um, that's basically what the corporate sector did to, to bend antitrust the other way. Could we redo that in the other direction? Would you drop it into to political campaigns to elect a president and a Senate that could change the composition of the Supreme Court, which would then top down try to change the minds of judges? That's a different tactic. I can't game that out. Like, I don't know. Maybe both, one or the other. I, like, I take 50, I, I'm, I'm, law professors tend to be very risk averse. So I would be very diversified across all the tactics and say, we got to do all of them because I don't know which one is actually going to pay off. I will uh, uh, invest a hundred million in uh, changing the, the way corporate votes takes place. Because if we start having shareholders limit a uh, corporation to use their money to pursue a particular agenda and be more transparent of what they're doing, we can fix the problem at the root. If we cannot succeed in that, I think every other avenue is, is uh, lost. And, and honestly, a hundred million to elect the president, they're not gonna be enough.
uh, the, the, the campaign is 2 billion. So with 100 million, maybe you can elect a senator these days, a couple, but not, mm, not even sure. Uh, sadly true. I, I would say the single most disappointing thing to me about the index fund industry has been their resistance to political disclosure. And, you know, I, I don't give financial advice and this is not meant to encourage anyone to change their patterns of, of investment, but I would not now have put all my money in Vanguard if I'd known uh, that that was the position they were going to take. And uh, now it's tough to find zero basis point ways to invest your money safely and diversified you know there are some other options and i do think that this will be a place of interesting competition over the next few years can any of the big three or big four or big five depending on how you think can any of them position themselves to respond to your question to gather assets i think they can like i think people are beginning to realize oh when i invest my money into a commodity product and I can get some of the political goals I want or not. I'd rather get it. And this is, a, you know, go back to reducing the complexity of what the choices are about. This to me is first order. If you can't get good information about how the political system is working, nothing else works. So I'm with you. If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I have on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should check out. It's called Entitled. International lawyers Claudia Flores and Tom Ginsburg have traveled the world, getting into the weeds of global human rights debates. On Entitled, they use their expertise to explore the stories and the thorny questions around why rights matter and what's the matter with rights. Subscribe to Entitled, part of the award-winning University of Chicago podcast network. So I did find him more compelling on the subject of solutions in the podcast than I did in his book, because I did come around to this view that transparency really is the critical thing here. But I also found it really disheartening that his stories about how opposed to any kind of transparency, private equity and index index funds are, that this isn't something that they're actively embracing, even though I guess I also did find it somewhat encouraging that at least privately, <laughs> um, um, which is ironic, but privately that, that, that people perhaps are a little more conciliatory than they are publicly. I think that index funds, there is an enormous political pressure to do something because uh, index funds have been caught between the rock and the hard place on the issue of ESG, on the issue of the environment and then social proposals at the uh, shareholders meeting. And so... They are actively trying to pass through the vote to the ultimate owners precisely to share some of the power. So I think that politically is untenable for them to maintain all that voting power without anything changing. So I am not that worried about the political dynamic there because it's already working through very effectively. By contrast, I think that the private equity does not have a clear pressure point because you don't see, for example, the Republicans being upset on anything that private equity does. Even the Democrat uh, seems to be pretty much in bed with it. I don't see the political pressure. And I see really a much, much bigger issue from an antitrust point of view, because, uh, you know, in the case I was describing in an introduction about anesthesiologist's office in uh, Texas, one of the defenses of the lawyers was, oh, you cannot conspire between a company and its subsidiary. This is a case back in the 80s. The language of the Sherman Antitrust Act is uh, conspire to restrain trade. And so you cannot conspire to restrain trade between a, a parent and a subsidiary because they're one and the same thing. But then they are saying that in private equity, a control company and the parent company are one and the same thing which means that uh, Blackstone or KKR are gigantic companies, much bigger than most of the companies we know. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, they, they, they really try to have it both both ways in a way that is incredibly frustrating and intellectually dishonest. And you saw that in the pandemic, too, where private equity companies tried to lobby to get their portfolio companies to have a piece of CARES Act money. And basically, they said, no, 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 these are all small businesses. They, they need CARES Act money. But then they also said at the very same time, look at how many people private equity employs now. What a big swath of the U.S. of the U.S. economy. And we invest on behalf half of all these teachers and firefighters. So you have to save our companies. So they're trying to have their size. They're trying to use their size when, as an advantage when they can. But they're also trying to hide behind their portfolio companies. I'm finishing a very dispiriting um, piece right now about private equities forays in the hospital business. And one of the private equity firms in question, when I called them for comment, said, no, 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 this is our portfolio company. You should call our portfolio company. All the decisions were made by them. Despite the fact that everybody knows that the portfolio company is controlled <laughs> by the private equity firm. And I almost I almost said, I've been doing this for 25 years. Please don't 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 try that on me. I, it just it was it was so infuriating and so intellectually dishonest. But that 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 is their line. But I, I wanted to come back to the point you you were making, the really great history that you laid out in our introduction, but as well the material that Coates covers in his book, which I really didn't understand that some of private equity's rise to power really was a function of lobbying. I I didn't understand that until it was laid out clearly for me in, in, in Coates's book. I had always thought that these big private equity firms um, were fairly hands off in Washington until they had to be. And I didn't realize that so many of the conditions that set the stage for their rise and for this transition from public markets to private markets has actually been fueled by, by lobbying money. And you're exactly right. You can see that it's both political parties in the, the, the so-called carried interest law, which is the inability to tax a portion of the compensation that, that private equity um, funds get, get at the normal rate rather than the capital private equity executives get at the capital at the, at the normal rate rather than the capital gains rate. And Democrats have refused to do anything about it, too. And that's because this is one of private equity's sticking points. And you can see how much political power they have in both parties by the, the failure of that to get through the, the Democratic Party. I mean, it's it's somewhat insane when you when you pause to think about it, and it's it, it's really upsetting. Right now, Congress has in, uh, announced um, Senators Grassley and Whitehouse have announced this bipartisan um, investigation into the role of private equity in health care. And <laughs> if, if anybody in Washington hears this, please make it real. Please make it real. What I'm worried about is that the behind the scenes lobbying are, is going to mean that this is one of many congressional investigations that gets announced to a lot of fanfare and then just quietly goes away because the political donations will mean that it's just not in anybody's interest to pursue this, even though it's incredibly important. On the point of the evolution of private equity, let, let me try because uh, several years ago, I, I look into this topic and actually I had some proposal to try to deal with this explosion of private equity. And some of the arguments that the lobbying industry did were legitimate in the following sense. Why do we have regulation of public markets? We had regulation because there are a lot of unsophisticated people who play in the public markets, and we need to protect them from abuse for two reasons. Number one, because we don't want to be hurt, but number two, that if we don't have a cop that protects them from being hurt, they will be reluctant to participate, and that makes the market less liquid. So everything looks great. Now, if you are... Warren Buffett, you don't really need the protection of the security regulation. And so this is the area where they started to put the nose, uh, the camera's nose under the tent and say, you know, we can make an exception for the more sophisticated people. And I think it's not a crazy idea to have that exception. The problem is that once you start, then the exception became more and more and, and, and uh, slowly there was an erosion of public market also because there is a huge differential cost. Uh, the fact that public markets have a lot of disclosure requirements make firms more reluctant to go to the public markets. And so my proposal several years ago was we need to reduce this gap, but not reduce in the way most people say that is only by cutting regulation in the public market. We should increase regulation in the private markets so that the difference is less uh, severe. Of course, nobody pay attention to what I said, but it's important to understand uh, uh, that there is a huge gap. And I think that this gap is not healthy. 
Yeah, I could not agree with you more. See, we start on a topic on which we don't agree and we come to this kumbaya moment of complete and total agreement. I, I really like your proposal. I like my proposal too, which is just to take everything that supposedly is private and say, okay, same regulations, same transparency requirements, then now see how you like it. That would be very satisfying to me. But that, that whole sophisticated investor thing is another smokescreen, I think, that private equity hides behind. Everybody knows knows that some of the pension funds, many of the pension funds that invest in big private equity firms or big hedge funds or big venture capital firms are not sophisticated investors. They're, they're not. And everybody understands the game that is play, getting played by which these, these big pension funds want to be able to report to their bosses a lack of volatility. And private market investments, because they don't aren't reported publicly, everybody gets to pretend that the loss didn't happen and hope that the next year makes it up. And then everybody, it's return smoothing and everybody gets to pretend that the loss the loss isn't real the way you don't if if everything is public and it's and it's marked and it's marked to a, a public market it's all the lack of honesty around it that the failure to just say what it is and call it as it is that really bothers me it's a lack of honesty it's a lack of transparency in this uh, quotes is right even the amount of lobbying if the industry was most transparent would be more visible probably would be more limited. And uh, when it comes to index funds, I like the idea of pass-through voting. That is the fact that uh, they uh, send their votes uh, to the ultimate investors. Now, this is very easy to be done with institutions. It's a little bit more complicated with individuals because most individuals don't participate. Uh, they hardly participate in presidential election, let alone in uh, every four years, let alone to vote for 500 companies every year. That would be crazy. But I think there are two very simple solutions. One is a solution of, of creating some guidelines, exactly like we don't vote for anything that uh, for all the legislation passed through Congress, but we have a party that we appoint that does that. You could have different guidelines for the parties, for the mutual funds, and they follow those guidelines. And then you pick the guidelines when you buy your Vanguard uh, S&P 500 fund. You say, oh, I wanted to vote uh, like X, or they want to vote like Y, and then automatically they vote in that direction. That, that could be one uh, idea. The other is actually an idea that I'm developing with Ellen Landemo. Do you remember that uh, she came to the podcast? And uh, it actually came uh, emerged from the podcast and, and Oliver Hart is to say, why don't we try to use the citizen assemblies, in this case, investor assemblies, to give some guidelines? So imagine you randomly draw 100 investors from uh, Vanguard and then you give them a minor stipend and a little bit of information to decide on how Vanguard should vote on major issues. Because they're randomly drawn, they're representative, and because you're one out of 100, probably you feel uh, worthwhile for you to spend the time, and uh, you do it for a year, and then next year somebody else will be elected. But in this way, you have a form of uh, uh, democratic representation, but not too costly for investors to, to, to do. I did think that it was encouraging that Coates did say that private equity firms do acknowledge and index funds do acknowledge privately that they that they have a problem given the power they exert in the halls of Congress, if they're not, there has to be some enormous amount of public pressure coming, not just political pressure, and they have to be willing to make the changes or the changes probably won't happen. I think you're more optimistic than I am because uh, <laughs> when... Uh, I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> when uh, rich people uh, in the private room say something to John Coates, I think they're trying to save their intellectual... Uh, uh, status by saying the right thing. Uh, when they move next to Washington, they do the opposite because it's in their interest. And it says, if they really believe that, you say it publicly. And if you only say it privately, then uh, you're either a coward or an hypocrite. <laughs> Jeez, Luis and Luigi, that might be the most cynical thing I've heard you I've heard you say yet. But you know, you 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 might be right. I guess the only caveat or the only counter argument is that everything is is negotiating leverage. And if they admit publicly that they know they have a problem and they conceded a really a really important point off off the bat. But you know, as I talk about this, I realize this might be something I need to dig into in Washington and start figuring out how how real the, the problem is. Well, we know the problem is real. But how how likely it is that 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 anything changes because that would be 
That would be a really interesting question. You have your new book, uh, Bethany, Private Equity in Washington. <laughs> right? Maybe. Instead of Mr. I mean, Smith I, goes to Washington, you have what? Mr. Private Equity go to... Uh, to I mean, I, Mr. Private Equity, exactly. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine, with production assistance from Utsov Gandhi, Sebastian Berka, and Brooke Fox. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts.